Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I know I'm the last thing standing between you and happy hour, so I'll try to keep this as a lively uh, conversation and less me talking and more questions and answers. Uh, my name's Scott Mayerwitz. I'm the digital storytelling editor for business and financial news at the Associated Press. Um, I start on newspapers, a print guy, uh, telling stories with just words. Slowly got into the TV industry and then came over to the wire service about seven years ago and I was actually an airline and travels reporter, uh, travel reporter. I spent a lot of time experimenting on projects and getting one of the oldest news organizations in the country to start thinking about new and different ways to tell stories. And a big part of that for us has been virtual reality and 360. And I'd say for the last two years, I've been one of the people who's been helping coordinate our efforts of getting our staff around the globe uh, outfitted with kits and shooting projects, as well as being one of the people to find that right balance between sort of promotional entertainment stories and actual news and finding ways to um, do some of those trickier stories. Uh, before I get started, how many of you in the room have shot VR 360 already? All right, great. And how many of you are just starting out completely fresh to this and want to learn the very basics? Perfect. Great. So I'm going to start with just uh, breaking through what it is, how it all works, and then give you some examples of what we've done, particularly in news gathering, to find it, and then open it up to uh, questions. Just a fun quote to start it off. Um, I think this really goes to our philosophy with this. When we try to find a project that works, we want to take people to a spot that they might not be able to go to and really immerse them. And you know, there's something to be said about having a quick video up of a behind the scenes tour backstage at let's say Hamilton. But it's very different to put you on that stage in the middle of a performance and see what it's like. Uh, one of the first ones we actually did like this was the New York Philharmonic does a concert in Central Park every year. And we did a series of cameras, including one with the conductor, several in the audience, all throughout uh, the performance and put that together into a piece. Uh, and that was a great way of kind of taking you where you would not normally be able to go. Here's stats that you probably all know, or if you don't, it's a growing market um, and expected to continue to grow in the next few years. And that's probably why you're all here right now. Uh, in the news space, there are a lot of folks who I would say are playing around with this. I don't think anyone has got this down just right yet. Um, including us. Uh, every week we seem to try something a little different and pivot and I think our competitors are doing the same. Uh, we started out for instance doing parades and festivals because that was a very easy way for us to get a camera out and cover something that was a little different from our normal news stream. Um, now we're trying to get a little bit more into longer stories where we get some narrators to come in there and we annotate something interesting and complex with some text. So this is, uh, this is what I personally see as one of the challenges. How do you actually view this? You know, on the far left we've got the Samsung Gear. On the far right, we've got the Oculus and Rift. Those are two of the higher end, more costly ways to view. And not everyone is going to spend the money to get these products. Um, my wife is very skeptical about 360, <laughs> which is kind of funny as I'm pegging part of my career to this. And I come home and I'm like, we just published our latest project, that thing I spent a week traveling on. And she's like, yeah, I don't get it. Um, so that is one of the big challenges here that you have to overcome. And you see in the middle some lower cost uh, versions, including, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the cardboard. Just put your phone in a very cheap piece of cardboard. I think a lot, well, someone was giving them out here today. So that's an affordable way to get that bit of experience. But I will say, when we did one of our first projects and brought back in the sources who gave us access, and they put on the goggles in our newsroom, 
everyone's jaw dropped. And I think uh, there is some bit of magic that first time you realize just how powerful this medium is. The question is, will people be able to trans transition over to it? If anyone has any questions at any point, please feel free to interrupt. Go ahead. You know, we posted a lot of our content in Facebook recently, uh, which was part of a deal, and a lot of people were just using the phone to move around. And when I go to sources and try to convince them to do a piece with us, I actually just send them a link that way and tell them to do it. And I, I personally think that's a great way to show the power, but the step from there to something like the Samsung Gear, it, it's, a ginor, it, it's a gigantic gap. And to really immerse yourself in that. And I think as the technology improves and we start getting sound linked in better with these VR experiences, which is a major shortcoming at this point, um, you'll see more people transitioning towards something like that. Uh, and I will say, as someone in news who's trying to convince someone to let us into their production facility or to do a 360 interview, it's a steep learning curve out there. Uh, your public relations folks are set up to understand print and video, and they don't quite understand what's involved. And oftentimes, I'll have them walk through with their phones and actually just do an iPhone walkthrough and I'm like, can you just show me some of the places you like and what it looks like? Do a spin around like this so we get a sense of what the space looks like. And nine out of 10 times, they're walking against a wall like this. And they're like, and here's our great shot of our factory. We've got this great balcony that overlooks it. And half the shot in 360 is just a bland wall. So there's a bit of a training that I think has to go on within um, you know, the media world of getting people to understand what's involved in these shoots. Uh, the other thing is we often like to do interviews where we're out of the shot and the PR person is out of the shot. We'll, we'll hide behind pillars, bushes, trees to get out of that shot. And a lot of PR companies are nervous about letting their person speak on their own without overhearing in real time what's being said. Uh, so that's one of our challenges that, as a news organization coming in saying, hey guys, this is what we'd like to do. Uh, this is just a little breakdown. A lot of people throw around VR 360 um, interchangeably, and I do it myself, and I probably will in the next 15 minutes do it. But here's a little bit of the breakdown. The, the VR is often much more an immersive experience, and it can be augmented. Um, we recently went to uh, ruins that were destroyed by ISIS and reconstructed them using animations. So you had a virtual reality walkthrough, and as you would look at the scenes, we would rebuild the destroyed runes using historical photos and drawings and that was an animation. That would fall on the left side in the virtual reality camp. 360 is much more just a plain photo or image of a, um, or a series of images. Um, what, it, what makes a good VR piece? And this is something that, um, as an editor whose job is to take our global, one of our global teams and get them thinking this way, it's a challenge because I get pitches all the time from my staff who are like, oh, yeah, this sounds great for VR. And I'm like, yeah, it's a good photo opportunity, but it's not really something immersive. So you know, I was talking about that Philharmonic uh, piece that we did. We put you right there as the conductors leading the Philharmonic. You've got the view out at the park. And for those of you who've spent time in New York, you know the Great Lawn at Central Park filled with 10,000 people is an amazing experience. And we gave you that view from up there on stage and in the aisles around, so you got to see it from different places. Um, 
The balloon ride piece was one of my favorites that I had actually pitched and set up but couldn't go because of a child care um, conflict. So one of my colleagues went. There's a hot air balloon festival in Albuquerque, New Mexico each year. And we mounted cameras up in balloons as they lifted off. We um, profiled a family that's been doing this for a number of years. And we also had um, shots with a sort of the air traffic controller on the ground pushing which balloons go where. And it was a great immersive piece because you'd put on the goggles and you'd just look up and there are hundreds of hot air balloons lifting off around you. And then you'd jump to shots looking back down. Um, so again, a place that you wouldn't visit. Um, we went to a refugee camp in France right near the entrance to the channel. Um, and we spent time in the camp in various tents and cooking places with these thousands of refugees. And this is not a place that most people would ever go. You're not going to do a 360 piece on your local shopping mall because we all know what a shopping mall looks like and it's not that exciting. But that shopping mall under construction, hey, that's a, you know, not everyone gets to do a hard hat tour of that. When I covered the airline industry, we focused on um, behind the scenes in airports in some of those crazy spaces that you'd never go to. We also did an above the top suites piece looking at a 4,000 square foot hotel suite of Four Seasons, um, a queen size bed on an airplane, and a two-story suite on a cruise ship. And that was, it was really travel porn in some sense. Uh, you got to see these incredible places that go for $50,000 a night and really look around in detail. So that's something that definitely works. Um, and then there's that emotional connection. Uh, one of the best pieces I saw in a long time, I think Huffington Post and Riot did this together, but I might be wrong, um, floodwaters down in the south, and it was a family going back to their house for the first time since the floodwaters had gone down. And they're taking a boat out there that's the opening shot, and you just see homes that are still flooded, and you go inside the home, and you're experiencing it with this family for the first time, but you're also seeing all the damage that happened in their home. Cameras, um, you can go out there, talk to the vendors. I'm sure there are a lot of them who will tell you what they find best. I would say right now there is not the best camera at all um, for anyone at this point in a great price point. The two cameras that we are using right now at AP are the Samsung Gear 360 and the Nikon Key Mission. Um, these are the two that happen to work best in our price point and for our staff. Um, and you're talking four or $500 roughly for these cameras and then accessories. What I will say, and I'm not endorsing either of these products, but the, um, the Nikon Key Mission gives us a little bit clearer picture and it gives us um, better sound quality um, and the files off of it auto stitch, uh, which for the, Stitching is you've got a camera on both sides and you need to sync up the footage to both of those. And the Nikon will do that for it. The Samsung, you have to run it through a program. It's very simple to do, but that um, extra step is sometimes needed out there. Uh, the big difference, the Samsung's got a really good app to go with it. It drains the battery, but um, you're able to see in real time what you're recording and what's going on, and you're able to remotely do that. The Nikon app is horrible. I think they know it. Nikon's good at making cameras. They're not good at making the technology to go with it. Uh, Samsung is much better at the technology to go with it. The camera's not as great. Um, I think each serves a purpose. Um, Nikon comes with a remote, which is better than the app but you're not able to see your shots. And I'll show you something I shot in a few minutes with the Nikon, and you can see where I messed up something because I didn't see my shot in advance. And it, I wouldn't say it ruined the piece, but it definitely brought the quality down. Anybody have any questions at this point? I know I'm kind of speeding through. Yeah. Did you address any questions 
So depending on, we did many, many tests on this because that's been one of the issues. Um, generally speaking, about 45 minutes of continuous video uh, is what the battery life does. And depending on what size SD card you have in here and what resolution you're shooting at, you can get about an hour's worth of footage on a memory card before it fills up. Uh, so that becomes an issue. Um, we were in Nashville doing a shoot of um, four folk singers singing in the round. And we had gotten permission to get to a very famous place to put our cameras between the, singer, the four singers. And because it was music, we had rights issues. So there was only one song in the entire set that we would be able to use again. And we had talked to the performer about it. She's like, oh yeah, it'll be my third song. What I didn't realize was that each person did a song in the round and went around, and it was actually the 12th song, and the memory card had filled up by that point, and we weren't able to go and swap it because the camera was right in the middle of the uh, action. We ended up having to negotiate rights for another one of her songs that was performed earlier on. Um, everybody had those portable battery chargers that you use for your phones. I, I take two to three of those with me on a shoot. Um, it, you have to learn where the dead spot is in 360. It's usually about a foot below where the camera is on the tripod. What I do is I take some gaffer's tape, I tape up one of those battery packs, plug it into the camera, and I can get two to three hours of shooting time out of it. Uh, in January, I was doing a ski shoot with an Olympian in Colorado, which I'll show in a few minutes. It was eight degrees out that day and snowing. My battery life was cut in third right there. Uh, so it was a, it's a big challenge with the cameras. Yep. You talked a lot about mounting the camera in somewhere in like a moving suit. Uh, how do you negotiate if you need to move the camera during the shoot? I mean, are you concerned with your camera person appearing? Yeah, uh, we try not to get the camera person appearing in most of our shoots and honestly what we end up doing is we take three to four cameras to a shoot depending on what it is. Um, there are a lot that we've done with just one but if we're doing something like the Philharmonic where we've got a camera on stage and we're not going to be able to retrieve that camera, uh, we'll set it up, we'll get it rolling. There'll be probably 10 or 15 minutes of dead space at the beginning while the orchestra is setting up. We get the first piece as the one we want to capture, and we get our two or three other cameras set up on tripods out in the audience. And then we sit there and we wait an hour and a half for a break where we can go and retrieve the camera from stage. Um, that's one of the reasons why these cameras work, because of the price point and the portability of it. I can go on a shoot with a carry-on suitcase and be anywhere in the world with three or four cameras. Um, when I did the ski, ski shoot with the Olympian in uh, Colorado, I was on a ski mountain. I had a tripod, a few clamps, and three cameras in a backpack that I was skiing with. Um, and we were skiing some hard trails. So you need to think about sort of the size of your camera, the portability, uh, and where you want to be taking it. The obvious problem is the limitation of that camera, which is battery life and some of the quality. These are some of the other cameras out there that we've used. Um, and we've gone from a $500 price point to um, $5,000 in the middle and I think over $20,000 for the one on the right. Um, the Omni, which, is, uh, which I actually really like, it's six GoPros connected goes for about $5,000. It's a great camera for really good, high quality images. The battery for it is about this big. Um, try going through airport security with that. Um, it is, the TSA has amp requirements of what they'll allow in carry-on and what they won't. It's two amps below what the threshold is. Like it's right at the edge of that. And we found that out the hard way going through airport security and almost missed our flight, uh, getting the paperwork lined up to match with it. It's a great camera. It's not practical for, I think, most people. 
uh, the Google Jump on the right is even better. I mean, you're talking 16 cameras rigged together, but that thing is a pain to carry around, and it attracts a lot of attention. We've done sh shoots in the last year at both of the uh, Democratic Republican conventions. We did one down at uh, Ground Zero, uh, highlighting 15 years since 9-11. And with small cameras, like the Nikon and the Samsung, people still come up, they walk around your camera, they kind of look at it, and they're like, oh, that's one of those 360s. It's still novel enough that people will stop what they're doing to look at. With these, everybody comes out of the woodwork and wants to see what it is. And in my opinion, that can kind of ruin a shot. And it doesn't let you as much flexibility as taking people into unique places. Any other questions at this point before I go through some of the cases of what we've been doing? Can you just set the camera to do like a 180? Or you, you can. Can you top and bottom? You, you could set it up to just shoot from one side. Um, but then you're kind of losing the power of this immersive technology. So we started in uh, September 2015, um, produced more than 75 experiences, which are more of what I call videos, but we've also done probably 30 or 40 photos in addition to that. Um, we, we go back and forth over how much time and energy something deserves, or sometimes does just a photo work. Um, and yeah, a good example was we were playing around with, uh, Starbucks has something called a rotisserie shop. It's like their highest high-end coffee shop. Uh, I think $15 for some of their drinks there. They've got a prototype in Seattle, one in Beijing, and they're opening one in New York soon. We took a camera in there and got these shots, and you actually see the coffee beans being roasted. They do these specialty drinks there. We didn't think that merited a full video, but we thought it'd be interesting to do a quick photo of that and take people in there. Um, so that's something that we are always back and forth. Uh, this is something that I would highly recommend if you want to take a photo of this link right here. This is our YouTube channel. Um, we distribute, we give some of our members content, we distribute through partners, we have a deal with Facebook and Twitter, but in the end, um, we try to post all of our stuff on YouTube just so there's a nice landing page. As a reporter and editor, it's great to be able to send people to that page and say, here's what we've been doing, and this is what yours will look like. And I find if you have the YouTube app on your phone, it's very easy to just take your phone, move around, move up and down, and get as much of that 360 experience as you can right there. Uh, and then this is just some of our partners that we've worked with. Google Expeditions is very interesting. It's um, very high resolution photos that we annotate and it's used for classrooms um, to kind of explain a site or history to someone. So you're able to walk around a room or a place and get a in-depth look at some of the key things in there. Um, these are just some of our metrics. Basically what we found is that engagement in 360 video just jumps way ahead of traditional video. People are on the site, on the content longer. They sh they're more likely to share it with friends. They're more likely to comment on it. Um, and the actual click through rate to actually pop it up in its own window and play it uh, is about six times as high as is our traditional video. So there is definitely a market out there for it. Um, it's just overcoming a lot of the challenges that we talked about being. Yep. This is from 2015? Uh, no, this is actually 2016 from no, uh, November, December with the stats. Um, I'm going to switch over here. So this is our YouTube page right here with just uh, some of the examples in it. Um, and I'll talk through a few of the challenges we had with shooting and uh, some of the things that worked. One of the 
biggest challenges that we found very early on is that you can't have quick cuts in 360 videos. Um, if you take a traditional video, you're going to see a lot of quick, snappy cuts. Uh, I did one at the New York Auto Show recently, and I had 20 different shots in the first three seconds. You know, quick car, quick car, quick car, model, showing car, another car. Um, you do that in 360, people are going to be vomiting. It's just really disorienting to have something like that happen. If you think about it, you know, in the ideal situation, someone's wearing the goggles and they want at least five to ten seconds to look around the room, see where they are, get their bearings, and then there are three to four seconds for you to highlight the key factor figure to them. The other big challenge is you can't really do movement in 360. So if I'm doing video, I might walk with that video camera down the aisle here to show me coming through the crowd. 360, you can't do that because the inner ear knows that you're not moving, but your eyes and brain feel like you're moving, and that can lead to uh, motion sickness too. So there are a few challenges to that. Um, the one really easy way to get around the motion issue is to find something as a frame of reference that's moving. So you can put a camera on an escalator. Uh, and we got a great shot in the 9-11 Museum downtown with that. But that involved me having the camera running, running quickly to the top of the escalator, planting the tripod, hoping that it stays um, flat, letting it run down the escalator, and then having at the last second a colleague swoop in at the bottom and catch it before it falls on the ground. Uh, but that was a great little shot that we had. For this one, um, we wanted to figure out, is there a market out there for 360 video in sports? In sports, you have a lot of challenges. The first being that we don't have the rights to most of the footage of sporting events. Um, mostly the big networks do. Um, so if you wanted to cover an Olympic race, well, NBC has exclusive rights to the Olympics. So you're not going to be able to get video out there but you can do training videos, which is why we, I went out to Colorado with the Olympian who was doing some training. The other issue is sometimes the action is really, really fast. You know, if, imagine putting a 360 camera in a soccer net and you see a goalie there. Well, you want that 10 seconds of footage so people get set up in the goal. That can probably work if you time it right just as the shot comes in and a goal is scored. But if you're doing something like skiing, where someone's coming down the mountain at 50, 60, 70 miles per hour, it's going to be a quick blur. So we played around with this. Um, let me play the video very quickly. So that's our opening shot. And what we actually have here is a camera on a tripod, almost like a selfie stick. Uh, you can see it there. And you can also see my mistake, because I was using the Nikon. I didn't wrap the wires around enough so you can see it. But we actually have him skiing through the woods, holding a stick with the camera on it. In this case, we felt it worked because you've got the trees as a frame of reference, and you don't get too sick, but you'll also notice this is the only movement in the entire video. All right, that body's round. We're here to try to at it. Here's the other movement shot, the, um, which is we are on a chairlift, and the chairlift is the frame of reference for you. So you at least know that you've got that chairlift, and that's not moving. So as you're visually coming up the mountain, that's sticking with you. Um, and this was actually a really hard shot to get because you'll notice he's alone on this chairlift. So we had to actually get the camera um, running, have him clamp it onto the bar after he sat down, and then run with it until the end. And I'll just play the rest here for you. Uh, Overtime today, but uh, always good times. And then he's actually supposed to preteens all about 
why I love it. But that thing in the world because no matter what the weather is like, no matter what you're doing, if you're on your skis, you're having a better day than a lot of people. So, uh, yeah. So this was how we overcame the sports challenge. If you look at that, it's about a two-second shot. He comes down the mountain, does a flip, turns around, and is done. What we did is we slowed down the video, we annotated it telling you what the trick was, and then we did a dotted line so you could follow him along as we were going through there. How are you adding any annotations? We do all of our editing in Adobe Premiere, and what we'll do is go in and create a new card for the an uh, for the for the annotation, and then animate. Um, because because we're using Nikon for this, it auto stitched, so that was easy enough to do. Uh, the one thing I haven't talked about yet is audio, and this is one of the biggest challenges I think of the equipment out there. Is the audio quality is horrible. You can get a little bit background noise, but not much. Uh, what we've done is set up a kit. It's a, one of those hard boxes with padding inside. It's about this big. We put a camera in there. We put a spare memory card and a spare battery, a charger, and then we have a little lav mic like what I'm wearing. And we actually hook it up to an iPhone. Um, I find it's the best way to get the recording and easy for the road. We have about 50 of these kits. Um, several of them are in places around the world, and a few are in regional hubs, and we can FedEx them out overnight to just about anywhere we need to be. So if there's an earthquake um, in southern Italy, our London team is going to get that there as quickly as possible so that we can get some 360 video of the aftermath there. We have about 15 of them right now just spread out in the United States alone. And the goal here is to have a system set up so that anyone can shoot. Um, our video crews are actually not the best ones for shooting. We find our still photographers have the best eyes for this because they're used to looking all around. Our video crews are very much used to thinking in 2D. Uh, so for audio, what we do is we mic everybody up. Uh, in this case, the skier had it uh, while riding the chairlift in his pocket. And what we do is just three audio spikes um, while both the camera and the cell phone are running. And what you'll find is that helps us sync up the two audio tracks when we're back in Adobe Premiere uh, editing it. And it can be a little bit of guesswork to get those two audio tracks exactly lined up, but it works out well so that you have someone's lips moving with the audio from the phone. And that works particularly well when you're in a very busy um, space. Which is going to bring me to our next video. We went to a uh, factory in uh, Tennessee where Nissan makes the Leaf, which is one of their all-electric vehicles. And they gave us full access. We were able to mount cameras inside the shell of the car as it was moving down the assembly line. And you can see this is as we start to do more annotations. Um, little stats to keep you going through the piece. Th this was with Premiere also we did. Uh, and we have a 360 plugin. Um, I personally love this one. It got 1.5 million views on Facebook. Just um, the size and scale of manufacturing is a perfect example. And I think a lot of people just love watching how things are made. Here we've got all these robots making the cars. Um, and it looks great in the headset. We tend to mix our videos with interviews. Um, Although I think we've been shifting away from it sometimes because it, um, if the interview is not really powerful, it takes away from the piece. Um, but this was a 248 piece, and we ended up uh, having, I think, two actual people in here interviewing. But the fun part is really seeing the cars being made. Um, and here, what we did was we got 
through the motion sickness by putting the tripod on the conveyor belt itself and speeding it up with time lapse. So you're able to see everything being made, but you still have a nice frame of reference. And here we are actually inside the car. Um, and the trick here is if you look up, we have a suction cup uh, mount and we were able to climb inside the car. You actually have to wear special protective gear because of all the sharp edges. And then we mounted it as it was moving down the production line, let it run for about 20 minutes, uh, keeping track of both the battery life and the memory card, and then sped that up as our final shot. And this was one where um, that golf cart from the opening shot was how we got around the factory floor. We had a laptop in there and we were dumping our SD cards onto the laptop as we were going through the shoot. We had three cameras with us. Usually two of them were running at any given time. Um, so this shot we had in the body of the car. There was another camera about four cars down the line doing the prior shot of us kind of going from the outside. Um, and then the third camera, we were busy charging and dumping the memory card. Does anybody have any questions? I know we've been talking for about half an hour. Um, I'm it for the day. The, there's no one following me. So I don't want to take up this entire hour. And I know that drinks are happening very soon, so I don't want to stop. But um, I've got one more video to show that I can in a minute, but I want to open it up to some questions first. Pro probably, you probably wouldn't. Um, I, I think it works best with multiple cameras. Um, you could have multiple live 360 cameras in different vantage points, but you'd really have to have good shots and know when to cut to it. And I think the thing with like sports is, are you going to be in the spot where that action is that's full 360? So let's say we're talking basketball. I'd want to mount a camera hanging probably a foot and a half off the top of a backboard. One, I'm not sure I'm going to get permission ever to do that. Um, but two, if I do, that's only going to be one third of the action maybe during a game. So where am I putting the other ones. Well, maybe one of the coaches and the bench, I can have a tripod right there, and it would work. But um, you're talking a lot of data that you're going to have to transmit live. You're going to need power sources for those, and you're going to need very quick editing for it. And I think after a while, you're going to get sick of watching that perspective. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we did a 360 photo from inauguration, and that was it. Yep. Yeah, so for those who couldn't hear, the question was talking about time length. You know, after four or five minutes, it's fine. You get to 15, you get motion sick, the video quality goes away. I don't want to say there's not a market for long form, but I think we, we get sick after five, six minutes of just the content and the experience. Um, unless you're sitting in a comfortable place and you've got goggles on and you can kind of look around, yeah, it's great. But if I'm holding a cardboard up to my head, I'm going to get sick of that after a few minutes. Or if I'm moving my phone around like this, I think I'm going to get sick of that experience, let alone the motion sickness. Um, and even the motion sickness, um, I think the jumping from one cut to another still gives you a bit of that motion sickness. And there's only so much you can take.
I, I think it's that chicken and egg question. Um, I think to get the audience and really win them over, the immersive experience shocks them. The first time people really wear the goggles and see something immersive, if it's done right, I think they're really excited about it. If they're doing it on the phone, they're like, oh, that's cool, I like it, it's different, but it's a bit more of a novelty. The challenge is you're wearing a headset, you get sweaty, you got to get the glasses lined up just right. You know, you want to walk around, but you don't want to hit things, so you end up doing it in a swivel chair. But I bang my knees way too many times on a filing cabinet watching 360 videos in that. Um, and who's going to pay $500 for a headset, unless you're really into video games and there's a market there? Um, maybe on long flights. You know, you, you, you could see a market where, I've heard airlines experimenting with that. You could rent VR headsets to people, maybe. Uh, so the question was uh, the learning curve to produce it and also the viability. Um, I think for me, the, the first learning curve was how to pitch this to sources to get access. Uh, that was the biggest challenge, was trying to convince people to even let us in and how to accurately describe it. And as many links as we sent out to folks, they still didn't quite understand it. I'll say UPS was the best. Um, we put a camera in a package going through their giant sort, and they instantly knew what we wanted. Um, the problem was the camera wasn't the best quality at the time. This was about two years ago, and um, looks fine, but it's a dark place. For me, the learning curve has been trying to think differently about how long each shot needs to be, and um, how to tell that story from different viewpoints and make it interesting. Uh, and at first, I said everything 360 around me has to be fantastic. I think now I'm, I'm OK with maybe 280. Um, I'm OK if there's like one thing that I can put at the back to the viewer as they start out. And yeah, they'll probably do this. I'm not sure they're going to do a full turnaround. Yeah, yeah, well, you can do 180, but I, I like a little bit more around. Uh, viability, <sighs> it's a big question. Um, Facebook has been a big sponsor of this um, because they want more time on site and because of their uh, ownership of Oculus. So they have an incentive to get content out there so that they sell more hardware. Uh, Samsung has sponsored the Daily 360 at the New York Times. And um, I, I don't know what their financial terms are, but my guess is that they gave 30, 40 cameras to the New York Times and the phones to go with it and some other startup cost, and then gave them money to produce this. And if I'm the New York Times, I'm going to jump at that revenue stream. And you, you know, it, it's a pretty good deal in the sense that they don't control what the content is, but their name's up front at the beginning and end of, the, of it. And they're obviously pushing the cameras. So I, I think that's a great question. And I, I know we have not figured it out uh, long term either. Yeah, no, we, we just track um, engagement, time spent, shareability, but we don't actually track where people are looking. But I would love to see that data if it's out there. Um, I, I'm curious, since this is such a new uh, narrative uh, mode that we haven't had before, yep. uh, apart from cuts, what experience have you had with trying to use other transitions? Yeah. Um, 
what we found, for instance, was, um, I'll show it as the closing piece. We did a piece, um, I guess it was a year ago, September, for the 15th anniversary of 9-11 attacks. And we wanted to really highlight how Ground Zero has changed. It's now a museum, a memorial, major office buildings, um, a tourist attraction, as well as people living within blocks of it and a major shopping mall that's now underground there. Um, and we had a lot of fade-ins, fade-outs for the transitions there. Um, but what we did is we started the piece off, um, if anyone's been to the top of the World Trade Center observation deck, they have a really great multimedia experience in the elevator where um, three of the four walls show the history of New York from basically colonial times to present, and you see skyscrapers rising above you, you see a brief tribute to the old towers, and then the doors open and you're at the top. That's how we decided to start our piece off. We ran a camera in an empty elevator up to the top and just recorded it all. Uh, so that was one of the transitions we did, and the doors open, and you hear welcome to One World Trade Observatory, and then we fade into the next piece. Um, the other thing there was the escalator shot that I was talking about. What we wanted to do was we went from above ground at the memorial pools to the 9-11 Museum, which is all underground. And there's a very moving sort of escalator ride in where you see all these national flags, and then you go into what is a very dark museum um, underground. And we use that escalator shot as a transition. So the, the idea is that you already have immersive technology. How can you get somebody in that mindset that they're maybe riding that escalator themselves or that elevator and taking that other one? Um, I've shot a few things at airports, and airport trams are great for this because you're able to go from one terminal to another, and it's a, it's a good uh, 360 one, but I haven't actually published anything on that yet. In the back. Uh, is there anything you're using to try and reorient users towards the action of the scene cuts? Because I'm looking over here, and there's cuts in the sky. Yep. Sure, so when you put together um, editing in Premiere, um, we have, it's sort of like building blocks across. Let's say you're lining four Legos up as bricks. Um, so to reorient people, there's a tool that lets you choose the orientation of the shot. So if I set up a camera with the two lenses this way, and I'm looking this way as the opening shot, but I really want to focus in here, what I can do is I can switch the coordinates of the camera. I could even have you looking down or up um, if I wanted to, although we start getting horizon distortions when you do that. Can you modify that between cuts? Yeah, uh, yeah. You mean from one cut to the next? Yeah, so each of those, let's say, four Lego building blocks across the way, I can modify the angle you're looking in each one of those cuts. Um, so that's something that we definitely do with all of our shots is you might have set up the camera this way when shooting, but then you decide, um, I really want this orientation. So you can switch that in the editing. Uh, the one thing I will actually warn everybody about is one of the big shortfalls with the cameras is that they don't necessarily sync the apertures between the two lenses. So. Um, we were shooting at a bar once uh, in Nashville, and we had the camera up on the bar where one of the singers was performing, and they had these bright stage lights. And one camera lens got this beautiful shot. There's a nice red hue coming in from this light, and the other shot is completely washed out. Um, and that's because the lenses don't sync, and we should have turned the camera just a little bit differently to get that done that way. So, question? Uh, this, the camera you're using here, was that the... the um, that was the Nikon. Um, were you able to, so the app was not connected to that? Viewing, I, I personally don't okay. like the Nikon app that much. Um, I find it doesn't sync to the phone as well. Um, it'll often drop the, the Bluetooth connection. Um, there is a remote that's much better to use to start and stop, but you're not looking at your shot. So were you able to see the shot at all? We, we were shooting blind on this yeah, one completely. 
Yeah. Um, experience gets you there, where you're able to get a sense mostly of what you're going to be shooting. Um, I did a recent shoot last month in a government facility that had very high security and um, had a row of windows at the top of one of the rooms. And one of the security restrictions was that we couldn't shoot the windows. Um, so I used the Samsung camera there and had the app there. And we had an escort the whole time. And we didn't want, it was a fine balance of saying yes or no on shots. So we chose the shot and they had veto power over if that shot was okay with their security. Um, we couldn't show any of the exits, we couldn't show any of the windows, there were a whole number of restrictions. So in that case, the Samsung with the app worked out great for us because I was able to look exactly at the footage um, as we were shooting it. I know I'm standing between you and drinks. Um, let me very quickly show you our 9-11 piece that we did, and then um, I'll stick around for questions afterwards. So here you are inside the elevator as it's coming up. Um, and the door, we oriented it so the doors are behind us right now. We could turn around and see them if you want to. Yeah. Here we are, One World Trade Observatory. But this was a great transition. One World Observatory. Doors open, and then we fade in. And this is one that we had a lot of narration over. We wrote a script for this, and we had um, a few of the people we interviewed come in and narrate for us. And this is actually one of the most boring shots. And you can see in the background here that the uh, Oculus Transit Hub is completely faded out. The camera is only able to really push that aperture so far. I probably could have corrected that a little in the shooting, um, but that's what we were able to do to make sure that this side came out OK and clear. But you see I've got the sunlight coming in one side. So it's a lot of thinking about where you position the camera, where your shade is, and all of that. Um, just going to jump ahead. And the other thing to think about is the distance that someone is from the camera. This is about two and a half feet. It works well. If someone's further away, it doesn't really look as well. So I got time for probably one more question, and then I'll stick around to answer some other things. Yeah, aside from iris, have you had any trouble with color balance between the cameras? Um, the color balance is easier to fix in post-production. So there have been a few little color balance issues, but um, that you're able to, to fix. So, well, I thank you guys for your time. I will stick around for a bit if anyone has any questions. And I've got some cards here if you want to follow up at a later date with me. So thank you so much for coming and enjoy drinks. <laughs>